have the honor of having Dr. Jane Morton today. Um, so Dr. Morton has had a fulfilling career as a general pediatrician with a long-standing interest in breastfeeding. She's conducted research on human milk and breastfeeding and has designed and implemented breastfeeding curriculums, novel practice changes, and policies that have been translated and widely used in thousands of hospitals to both train staff and to train new mothers. So help us in welcoming Dr. Jane Morton. And Let's get started. And what I'm gonna to do today is I'm going to try to summarize every single thing I wish I knew when I started so that I could have helped many more mothers, not just overcome problems, but prevent problems. Let's go to the first slide and let you know that I have no disclosures to make. And the outline of the talk today is um, how to prevent the biggest challenges, which are the complications of breastfeeding and early cessation, early cessation meaning within the first month. And then we'll move on to the sciences uh, um, behind this uh, approach of A, B, and C. And so, first of all, again, I want to try to keep this as simple as possible. And let me tell you why. This was a Picasso etching in back of the desk of Steve Jobs. Do you remember Steve Jobs, the Apple guy? And he, um, he started off with this oxen um, up here, but he ended up with the oxen at the right lower corner. That was where he wanted to go. Just simple and beautiful. And we are all teachers. We have to be teachers in the field that we're in. And people remember simplicity. And so what I, what I found works for me is a format where I can organize my own thoughts and uh, explain to mothers without going into a million different tangents um, what the most critical things are that we need to accomplish and in a memorable way. So that's what I mean. So in that vein, what I'd like to do is to keep it A, B, and C. And these are precisely the reasons that mothers give for quitting abandoning breastfeeding in the first month. So the first is attachment, which is more of a problem in the first couple of weeks, difficulty with latch or milk transfer. And then we get on to the mega problem, breast milk production, mothers who won't make enough milk. And then we get on to C, which is a complication of both of them, babies who won't receive enough milk. So the bottom line, cutting to the quick, is that what we do, or more importantly, what we don't do in the first three days, even in the first hours, directly relates to these complications and early cessation. So here's a little uh, chart showing you that there's about, uh, differs in different studies, but about a 20% drop off by one month in low risk term dyads. And again, the reasons relate to attachment, breast milk production uh, and calories or consumption uh, of the baby. So the reasons for early cessation uh, um, in low risk, in high risk mothers are the same as in low risk mothers. Um, and one thing I want you to remember is that not only are they still ABC, but that return to work or school is a very uncommon reason for early cessation in the first month. So uh, um, really, if we, it, it, it makes it simple for us because that's where we need to target. And um, the, the, not only are these the major reasons, but they're the, um, uh, they result in very serious health and financial burdens, um, such as hyperbilirubinemia, dehydration, and hypernatremia. So very worrisome, uh, potentially um, lifelong problems 
uh, in babies if they get into severe complications. But even more so, I think that the way I see breastfeeding is that when a mother can successfully breastfeed, it's like a stepping stone into feeling confident about herself um, as a new mother. And when she can't breastfeed, it's a serious, uh, um, less comfortably verbalized insult to her sense of confidence. And people will say, well, you know, I didn't breastfeed either. A little bit of formula is not a problem. And you've heard all of this. But it goes deeper than that. There's a real mourning. There's a real sadness uh, if one tries to do um, uh, what she wants to be able to do and then ends up with complications. There's a sense of inadequacy. So these <clears throat> medical reasons, by the way, are the key reasons for delayed discharge and readmission, readmission to the hospital in the first two weeks for the infant. And this is globally. This is not just a US problem or a, a, a certain financial uh, level problem. This is globally. So <clears throat> the risk for early cessation is interesting because people think of term as 37 weeks and up and maybe you know late preterm would be uh, uh, that's where the problems start. But, Oddly enough, it's early term babies that have problems as well. So <clears throat> 40 week gestation, that's your least complicated time. Sarah, is there, everything like, okay? Um, I am trying to find that one to mute them. I will do, I'm- Okay, no problem. no problem. I just didn't know I was doing something wrong. No, ma'am, you are okay. fine. So so 40 weeks is, the, is the, the easiest time to breastfeed, 37 to uh, 39 weeks called early term babies. Uh, it's a step down, more complications there. And then the big surprise is we take a big step and babies less than 30 weeks are next. So that means that these teeny little two pounders are better off than those five pounders those late preterm babies. And we'll talk about that as we go on. So the morbidity doubles for each gestational week earlier than 38. Uh, the population of early babies less than 39 weeks is unlikely to decrease. So our job is not gonna get easier. These are always gonna be part of our beloved population because of two main things. First of all, demographic, demographic factors, two main things that uh, increase the likelihood of delivering a baby early. And those are obesity, advanced maternal age, those demographic factors, and obstetrical practice, particularly cesarean section, induction, and, uh, um, and so forth. So, so for reasons that are beyond our control, we're unlikely to have an easier population as we go along in time. Now, what are the opportunities to prevent problems? They're great if you just think of the drop-off rate for first-time mothers of term babies being, as we said, somewhere around 20 to 24% here in this study, <clears throat> early term babies, 27%, you can see it's a pretty big step up for what we still consider term. But the real ringer is this 36%, over a third of late preterm babies, 34 to 36 weekers. These are the, 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 the ones we really need to give special attention to. And one thing we have to be uh, understand is that these late preterm infants the breastfeeding rates do not seem to be impacted by baby friendly practices such as first hour skin to skin, roaming in and no pacifiers. Now, not that any of those are wrong or anything else, they're terrific. And we, we want to practice baby friendly practices, but they're just not enough for late preterm babies. And we'll talk about that. 
So let's now turn to the science. So in the first hour, every mammal uh, uh, struggles or doesn't struggle. Sometimes it's more automatic, <clears throat> but there's this natural inclination to pull a baby towards you and to try to uh, help your, your little one. And what are the four important key points about attachment? So first we'll talk about A, attachment. The first thing is it's time sensitive. And we'll talk about the interval between birth uh, and the first feeding. The second is it's not always automatic and things like uh, um, surgery, drugs, preterm delivery uh, may impact how easily a baby learns to attach. The third and fourth are that it improves. It improves with two things, uninterrupted contact. And I don't mean t-shirt to bra, I mean skin to skin. And it improves with, as production goes up. So the higher the production, the easier it is for the baby. So think of this as sort of continuity for a baby who um, uh, is surrounded in the amniotic fluid with this nice warm con uh, fluid, hearing a mother's heartbeat, receiving a mother's immunities, uh, um, being touched, and importantly, a sense of smell in the amniotic fluid called pheromones. And these pheromones are very unique in each mother, differ in one mother to another. And pheromones <clears throat> depend on a mother's genetics and her diet. And this scent in the amniotic fluid is not there just as an air freshener or amniotic fluid freshener. It's there to stimulate a baby's what's called nutritive behavior learning how to suck, to swallow, to root. You'll notice in ultrasounds early in the 30th weeks, babies have their hands close to their uh, cheeks, learning how to root and suck. And maybe many babies are born with little blisters on their hands from sucking on their hands. And interestingly, that very same pheromone is in the Montgomery tubercles, the little bumps around the areola, in the oils of those Montgomery tubercles, and in early milk and colostrum. And so the way a baby finds the breast or is stimulated to adapt that nutritive behavior after birth is very same in babies who can see and babies who are blind. The sense of smell is keener at birth than it'll ever be again in our lives. This is also the same scent that attracts mammal, other mammals to the breast as well. So in, in putting the baby skin to skin right after birth, we're keeping that connection of scent, of touch, of sound, of immunity, of much more so that uh, um, birth is uh, breastfeeding is sort of the last best stage of the birth process. So here's a little one. You'll not even notice that his eyes are closed. Here's strike one. Not quite. And strike two. Now the last picture there you can see that that baby is on not exactly what you might call a deep latch. And if that was as good as that little kid could do, that mother would surely end up with some sore nipples. Uh, um, so it's not always perfect. It may need a little help and adjustment to uh, uh, eventually have an effective and comfortable latch. But here's what I want you to remember. The longer the interval between birth and the first feeding, 
the more likely a baby is to have what they call dysfunctional attachment. It used to be much more common in the days when we would always remove babies and wash them first and talk them and send them and then send them back to their mothers and break this continuity. But even with uh, um, putting babies skin to skin right away, it, there may, it may not always be perfect. Some babies ace it and some babies don't. So here's a little wet head needing um, just a little help from the mother to get a more comfortable deeper latch. Here's a study by Carberry. There are several others as well, but this is a nice one. Uh, looking at the timing of the first feed in healthy term babies with good APGAR scores, less than one hour, and then in the hours afterwards. And she noted that the longer the interval between birth and the first feeding, the rate greater the risk for poor feeding, which was scored uh, the way the British score them. And that the predictors of breastfeeding difficulty included being a first time mother, an emergency uh, cesarean delivery and elective cesarean delivery. But even when stratified by these variables, the risk of delay was the strongest factor uh, uh, influencing whether or not a baby had difficulty. And if you think about it, it's a rather complicated uh, you know, it's kind of interesting and it's amazing the baby can do this. So if you look at this first baby with this nice wide gaping mouth uh, and a deep latch so that the, the nipple, if you drew a line from the tip of the baby's nose to the base of the earlobe, somewhere almost midway, once the nipple is pulled out a bit, is back in this nice protected spot back here. And uh, the baby has a much more sustained suck, suck with very short and infrequent pauses. In contrast to this little baby with a whistle mouth who looks like he's drinking out of a straw. And if you imagine where that nipple is, it's probably right about there, getting rubbed and massaged by the tongue and jaw of the baby and a, uh, probably a painful latch, and that baby has sort of short sucking bursts with long frequent pauses and less effectively using the jaw and tongue to remove milk because that baby is um, nipple sucking, you could say, rather than breast feeding. So some babies need a little help and what we've learned from our preterm, from the NICU babies, is from our, uh, uh, as they are, you know, born at two weeks and gavage fed and maybe then bottle fed and then try to transition to the breast, um, is that the babies are, have the easiest time transitioning to the breast when the production is robust. And when uh, um, there's a lot of skin to skin, but production is key. If you have just equal supply demand, it's much harder for those little preemies to learn how to nurse. But if you have it much higher, somewhere in the 750 range per day, 750 mLs a day, that's an easier flow. And if you think of the first time you ever read, rode a two-wheel bike, um, and there was this aha moment in the beginning, when you were learning how to do it, you would always sort of go slowly and put the brakes on and not want to fall. But then you learned that if you just gunned it and you just went fast, it was easier to balance. And it's the same with a little baby learning how to latch for the first time. If the flow of milk is very easy, it allows them to make a few mistakes with their mouth, but to keep going, the milk keeps flowing. So they, they, they start getting into the rhythm of how to suckle. Which brings us, talking about robust production, to B. So A, attachment, B, breast milk production. And let's talk about the key points. The first point to remember, and you'll hear me say this so many times, I'm sorry, but it's so important. 
that production is the strongest determinant of how long and how exclusively a mother breastfeeds. It's the strongest factor. It is essentially the cornerstone of breastfeeding. And even though we're just talking about the first month, really an early cessation in this talk, and it accounts for towards the third and fourth week of that month, it, it's the major reason for giving up on breastfeeding. If you look at the first year, mother 60% of mothers stop earlier than they want. And production is the strongest factor, the, the strongest factor given for reasons that mothers give up on breastfeeding before they wanted to. So the second point, so production is this determines duration and exclusivity. The second point is that while hormones set the stage, such as the placenta's delivery, there's the drop in progesterone, there's oxytocin. So hormones set the stage, but subsequent milk production potential, meaning what you are capable of producing weeks down the pipe, depends on colostrum removal in the first three days. So it not only depends on uh, uh, how early you start, it depends on how frequently it's removed, and it depends on how effectively it's removed. So all three of these are critical. So let's first talk about early. This is obviously a C-section delivery with a baby on the chest before the mother has even been uh, sewn up. Now, I've been in labor and delivery uh, working with mothers quite a bit, and rarely do I ever see a spray of colostrum like this, except in the first hour. And this is a collection of colostrum from that first expression from a C-section mother. So the hormones in many mothers who uh, um, have the right setup, if you think of uh, um, obviously a mother who is very sick or is anxious or is vomiting or whatever, um, may not be able to uh, relax enough to have a letdown or whatever, but um, the, this, this, the, the hormones usually, in a, especially in a vaginal delivery, are so supportive of first hour feedings that in, you can see in this study that, uh, oops, did I, yeah, I think I went too fast, that in this study, uh, looking at first hour expression in mothers, pump dependent mothers of preterm babies um, versus hours two through six, that the volume, the average volume expressed in the first hour was, whoops, I keep doing that, excuse me, was significantly higher than mothers who expressed hours two through six. Not only that, but if you look at these bars over here, the blue bars, are um, the mothers who expressed in the first hour compared to the purple bars, the hours who, the mothers who expressed thereafter. Uh, and obviously the first hour mothers kept their advantage up to week six. Uh, so they had more milk in the first hour and larger volumes uh, increased production later on by 130% at six weeks. But frequency, excuse me, early is not enough. Frequent is also critical too. And these same uh, um, researchers did another study just this year, just a few months ago, that looked at first hour expression and compared it to uh, hours two through six. And they didn't find the same uh, of the same uh, as this first study. And if you look at what they did find, these are, the, again, these are the first hour people again. These yellow bars are, whoops, how much mothers produced in the first hour. 
But if you look at the study carefully and look at the, the, the data, which is always very helpful when you start, before you go rush to the conclusions, looking at the data, the mothers uh, nursed less frequently if they had first hour exp uh, 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 expression. Excuse me, it was all expression, it wasn't nursing. Um, so they let, nursed less than four times, four times or less a day. And that just doesn't do it to bump up your milk production. So what is frequently enough if you're expressing from the first hour? There are several studies, um, one by Lydia Furman back in 2002, one very recently uh, um, by Rue, that said, looked at the tipping point for pumping frequency to establish a robust production, 750 mLs a day by day 14, was six or more times a day. So I think that if you look at how frequent do we need to really ask mothers to pump? Um, it's at least six times a day, preferably more, to establish a good production. So early, frequent, effective. Now, if you're breastfeeding, how frequently do you need to breastfeed to initiate, initiate an adequate supply? And this is a new study. Uh, um, uh, that came out of China that compared the difference between group one, mothers who nursed less than 10 times a day, those that nursed more than 10 times a day. And by 28 days, group two versus group one um, ingested uh, more feed and gained more weight from birth. Uh, so that looked to be, uh, uh, you know, and that's not a big surprise every two to three hours, but it, it begs the point of you could have a baby on the breast, like a late preterm baby who is nursing frequently. Actually, they tend to be sleepy babies, so they don't do that. But if you had a baby on the breast who was not very effective, 10 days a day, 10 times a day may not be all there is. So we really need to think of early, frequent, and effective. And if you think about it, all of you are so experienced, it's really hard to tell how much colostrum a baby is actually getting uh, um, uh, it, when they're nursing, how effective they are. Sometimes it's easy, but frequently it's not. So let's take a look at markers of effective removal. Now, what we found <laughs> is that um, there's a change in the composition of uh, um, colostrum to mature milk that helps us figure out what's going on here. And if you notice here that in this study, volume starts going up by about day two, it's just beginning to creep. And then by day three, it starts going up higher. The important thing is also to notice that the sodium here starts going down. So, and the sugar starts going up. So colostrum is very salty, filled with immunoglobulins and protective substances, but it's not very nutritious. It becomes nutritious when the, what's something called the the, the, the junctions between the little milk secretory cells close. So let's take a look at that and we'll see that this drop in sodium heralds the rise in volume, but it's only, only with frequent and effective removal of colostrum that the, the, the cells are closed. So let's take a look at this. Think of the little balloons, the little alveoli in the breast, and those uh, uh, what are called galactocytes, those little cells that produce milk. The, oops, the junctions between them are open during pregnancy, and that allows for the influx and efflux of protective, more blood-borne protective substances that make up colostrum. And uh, um, with the removal of colostrum, the junctions close and then, I certainly can't, don't understand it, but when the junctions between those little cells close, 
there's more cell to cell communication, which starts the factories to produce nutritious factors such as fat and salt, excuse me, and sugar, as the milk becomes nutritious. So it starts out protective, continues protective, but very protective, and then becomes more nutritious. And so a personal note, um, when I started my uh, um, uh, general practice, I had these dedicated mothers come in to me wanting to breastfeed. Feed. Their, their sense of wanting to breastfeed was never the problem. It was more of an issue of me not knowing enough. But not having enough milk became the most troublesome problem that these mothers had. And despite you know, learn, help, learning how to help them correct attachment issues, encouraging them to nurse frequently, encouraging them to express if needed. Production remained the most stubborn problem to fix. And that led me to do my very first study. Let's see, this was in 19, here, I can go right to it. You can see that dinosaur at the top. That's how old I was, that this study is. It, it was in 1994. And what I did was I took 130 mothers and on day three, I got a sodium from the right breast and from the left breast from their milk. And the normal drop around day three or so was highly predictive of successful breastfeeding at one month, the baby who gained enough milk and was exclusively breastfed. But the longer the sodium remained elevated, the higher the risk for impaired production for the mother not being able to produce enough milk for her baby. So by day three, even, many mothers faced this uphill battle to establish production, meaning that problems became less remedial the longer we went out, suggesting that the earlier you fix problems, the, the better the uh, opportunity for the mother. Now, since I did that study, many authors have done much better studies. And here, this one I, I particularly like, uh, uh, done in 2007. And this researcher on day three, she, she's looking at effective milk removal. So early, frequent, effective. And the way she looked at effective is she looked at the pre and post weights of babies every single time they fed for 24 hours on that third day when she got the breast milk sodium. And no surprise, she found an inverse relationship between the drop in sodium and the intake in breast milk in those babies. So to really get milk going well, we need early, frequent, and effective removal. And we need to remember that the longer that this does not happen automatically, that your body does not know how many babies you've had, twins, triplets, whatever. It, that it is that, it, that if you if you had twins or triplets, you know you would be nursing all the time. And that's what uh, uh, stimulates, that's how you phone in your order for a good milk supply. So production, production, production. It's the strongest determinant. Um, the complications of not having enough pose very serious health risks, uh, and, and it's less remedial with time. Now, a study done um, by Kair on low, uh, on, um, uh, um, um, on preterm babies, um, she she looked she evaluated the mother's experience, and it was a very interesting, insightful study that showed mothers had a free, open uh, um, stage to express how exhaustive and demoralizing the remedial regimens were to try to get their production up if it faltered initially, and especially triple feeding. It's, it's so hard to ask mothers to go out and triple feed. And think how commonly we do this in the first 
a discharge when a baby is less than 10% below birth weight. Even worse, here she is trying to do her best for her newborn. And she learns right as she's on the launching pad of discharge that her best effort actually put her baby in harm's way. And now her baby is overly jaundiced, de excessive weight loss, and she feels uh, a, a sense of inadequacy. And finally, a Cochrane view that came out a few months ago looked at oral galactagogues, natural therapies, and drug therapies, and found that due to extremely limited, very low certainty evidence, uh, we do not really know for sure whether the galact galactagogues have any effect on the proportion of mothers who continue breastfeeding at three months, four months, and six months. Low certainty evidence that these pharmacological galactagogues may increase milk volume. Not to say not to use them, but just to know that we can't count on a whole lot of other factors uh, um, later. We try everything, but it's our opportunity is early on. So what we know already, the production is the strongest determinant Hormones set the stage for early frequent effective removal of colostrum to determine future production potential. First hour colostrum removal sends a strong signal. High frequency is necessary for establishment, but less necessary later on. Effective, can you rely on the newborn to remove enough colostrum early and frequently enough for the baby to get optimal intake and the mother to produce enough. And if not, in the first hour, what is the most effective way to remove viscous colostrum? And what is the evidence? So we'll talk about that in our next talk. When I was giving a presentation somewhere in this wonderful country, um, a nurse came up to me afterwards and gave me the analogy that she always uses that I have ever since used with my mother's, that it's like launching a rocket ship, that boost off takes the most energy. And once you break out of the stratosphere, you get to coast. It's much easier. But if the trajectory of the rocket goes off without that energy and it starts gliding not straight up but more at an angle then it takes much more energy to get out of that stratosphere and you may not so not to think of breastfeeding is as hard as it will always be but in the beginning it's no time to greet all your family and have the flowers and tell the 50th version of your C-section delivery. It's the time to focus on getting breastfeeding right. Production within the first four days only predicts future milk uh, production potential. So very early on. So we've talked about attachment. We've talked about breast milk production. And now we'll talk about calories for term babies. Now, I used to think that colostrum had, was so small in volume that it had to be very nutritious, but it is not. It only has 80% of the calories compared to mature milk or formula. And we all know that the average intake of colostrum is very small, a teaspoon or two at a feeding in the first couple of days. So the term baby obviously loses weight but what is the term baby's fuel? And his fuel is his, uh, his, his resources, his re are his reserves, his fat, his stores, the breakdown of, there are actually three metabolic pathways, the breakdown of starch, the synthesis of amino acids, and the breakdown of fatty acids. And he, so he lives off of these stores in the first three days before he gets the more nutritious mature milk. So why 
if he's living off of his own stores, is he born hungry? What do they want to feed in the first hour? And of course, I've already told you that there's this drive to nurse from one's scent, one's sense of smell. Um, but, the, you know, the cord is cut many times right after the baby's on the chest or shortly thereafter. So he's actually maybe not even through the last supper when he's trying so desperately to get the breath. What we need to remember is that babies at this point are not hungry, but they're searching for protection. And unlike donor milk even, a mother's own colostrum, particularly colostrum, which we don't have in donor milk, provides tailor-made, absolutely unique, active and passive immunity for the mother's own baby. So active, might be a passive immunity. We all are very familiar with our immunoglobulins in the mother's milk that reflect her past history of infection. Active, we've only learned about in the last five to 10 years, and this is an explosive field where we're recognizing these bioactive components of human milk that are very different the, the, the composition of, say, oligosaccharides in mothers is very different, again, very unique, one mother to the next. And they do, they, in, if you were kind of to put it in a nutshell, in a most simplistic way, they potentiate the infant's own immune system because your gut is your largest uh, uh, um, immune system in your body. It's the, in, the, the largest uh, organ for, of the immune system in the body. Uh, and this is the big screener. And this is where the immunity of the baby really takes place right here. So it enables the beneficial microbiomes in the baby's gut and many other uh, um, pathways to stimulate the baby's own immune function. So both passive and active protection. So the term baby's needs are initially small, but he can never, because there's not a, that much of it, there's, he can never get too much colostrum. If you, if you uh, uh, it, spoon feed a baby colostrum who's had a nice feeding and they don't want it, they sleep, they don't take it, but you can, they will, if you offer it to a baby, you can always take more and you can never over colostrum feed a baby. Of course you can, a bottle formula fed baby, but a, a colostrum fed baby, you can't overfeed that baby. The, but you can't underfeed, and that's where all the problems are with underfeeding. And the, so the early clinical indicators of enough are going to be the weight loss, the normal weight loss trajectory, bilirubin, the normal bilirubin levels, and bilirubin uh, um, is important. It has a positive actions in the body, the stool color, and the stool frequency. Let's look at those three things. So the weight loss trajectory, the average weight loss is about six to seven percent. And by six hours, weight loss differentials for infants at risk for losing too much weight, as we define in this study, over 10 percent, become evident. So very early on, we see evidence in, by weight of babies who are not taking uh, significant volumes. By one day, weight loss over 5%, 5 percent, five more, predict, pre, will predict eventual excessive weight loss. That doesn't mean we have to get freaked out about five percent weight loss in 24 hours, but we need to keep our our ears perked on that and our eyes open and watching uh, at that one. By 48 hours, five percent of vaginal births 
10% of cesarean births have lost over 10%. So by two days, and we'll talk about by three days later on, but you can see what the point being here that very early on, you start seeing weight differentials. And these nomograms predict weight loss per hour of life help determine the infants at risk for excessive weight. So you may all be aware of and if not, take a look at the newborn weight tool or the NEWT, N-E-W-T, that helps you plot out what percent your baby is per hour of life. They're very helpful. So let's move now to bilirubin. And we'll get back to weight in a little bit, but let's talk about bilirubin now. And a lot of mothers um, don't understand why bilirubin and breastfeeding uh, uh, work together. So I'm just going to tell you my simplistic way of explaining it to mothers. <clears throat> a fetus is born in a relatively, uh, a fetus lives in a relatively low oxygen environment in the amniotic fluid. And so he or she responds by producing a high number of red blood cells. So if you take a newborn's blood and spin it down and centrifuge it, about average 55% of that too will be red blood cells. His mother, if I do the same for her, the average mother will be somewhere around 35% because all these little red blood cells that carry oxygen are higher in the baby. Now he's born into this oxygen rich environment and he doesn't need all these red blood cells that happen to have a shorter half-life. So they start breaking down and the trash, the byproducts of the broken down red blood cells are bili become bilirubin. And the liver is the trash man. So the liver conjugates, packages up all this trash and puts it into the gut to be excreted. Now, colostrum is a laxative. So with enough colostrum, the baby excretes the bilirubin. Without enough feeding, the packaging breaks down, the bilirubin become, becomes unconjugated, and it gets reabsorbed into the bloodstream. So the more colostrum he gets, the lower the jaundice level he gets. Oops, excuse me. So suboptimal intake results in reabsorbed bilirubin and hyperbilirubinemia. The four primary risk factors for too much jaundice are underfeeding, big one, prematurity, genetics, Asian babies are tend to get more, and hemolytic diseases like ABO incompatibility. In all of these, bilirubin can be modified by early, frequent, and effective feeding. And so the uh, Jeffrey Mazel and Valerie Flareman in the ABM protocol, and if you don't know about it, ABM protocols, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine protocols, they are fabulous. And having worked on many myself, it, we, we, we work very hard to get the best articles and the best research and they're always being updated. So make sure you know about these free protocols from the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine website. Their recommendation is that the first and best supplement to prevent hyperbilirubinemia is hand expressed spoon or cup fed colostrum. The third thing is stool color and frequency. Now, a lot of people will give the advice of how many wet diapers does the baby have, but <clears throat> if you think about it, how many wet diapers the baby has sort of depends on how often you change a baby. But what the stool color is or how many poops is much clearer and actually much more accurate. So day five, bright yellow mustard, taxi colored, you can't say uber colored poops and uh, are what you want to see. So if a mother is calling you up 
And she's saying, I just don't think I have enough milk. I'm really, I'm just nursing every two hours. My baby doesn't seem to be full and blah, blah, blah. And you say, okay, day five, what color are your baby's poops? They're yellow. And you can just take a big breath and say, you are doing a fabulous job. Not to worry. I, I know it's hard, but, and it's going to get easier, but these yellow poops are essentially the sign of victory. That's what we're looking for. So let's think about the time sensitive nature of A, B, and C. For attachment, the longer the interval between birth and the first feeding, the more likely that the baby is to have uh, suboptimal attachment. B, that uh, uh, breast milk production um, is the cornerstone of breastfeeding and that the first hour is extremely important and that high frequency is much more important for establishment early on to boost this rocket ship. And that calories delaying the first feed past the first hour may be associated with reduced intake of the baby extending over the next few days. And we will discuss that later and I'll show you the evidence. So when all goes well and we come into the room of a new mother and take a look at how things are going, and like show me how you're latching, baby latching, everything else, we can really focus on getting all the kinks out of attachment and you know, positioning and everything that helps a uh, um, uh, mother feel comfortable and helps the baby feel effective at removing milk. And that will promote significant breast milk production, which will pr promote uh, um, adequate caloric or consumption intake. But when all does not go well, if we spend all of our time trying to fix attachment and trying to get that right, we may miss out on the opportunity to promote breast milk production and caloric intake. And what we always need to remember is that the baby who's struggling with attachment gets better when production is high. So one thing we can do is say, Babies get better when production is a little higher, it makes it easier to learn. And your baby may need a little bit of help. And the best way to help your baby is to boost your production up a little bit. So let me show you how to do that. So to conclude, uh, science has spotlighted this time sensitive window for opportunities in the first hours which is sort of the natural conclusion, as we said, of the birth chapter, keeping these, that connection. And are we enabling mothers to take full advantage of this time and prevent common problems in breastfeeding with A, B, and C? Or are we bending too far to this hands-off, wait and see, let's see how things go overnight and we'll look at the weight tomorrow and this sort of problem oriented approach of let's see how jaundiced the baby gets. And in this problem oriented approach, inadvertently fostering uh, um, preventable problems with demanding regimens and less remedial solutions. So again, what we do or what we don't do in the first three days, even in the first hours, directly relates to the complications uh, that lead that are the major three causes for early cessation. And here's a, our real opportunity to uh, um, really turn the corner on this so we don't have so many mothers and so many babies with complications. So the question comes up, might normalizing the use of hand techniques with breastfeeding from the very first hour reduce complications associated with early cessation and offer a leg up to all high-risk dyads? This is a question needing an answer. We'll talk more about it. So thank you.